بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان وهدى إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وعملا وإخلاصا يا رب العالمين Imam Afroz gave such a powerful presentation on finding Allah with the brokenhearted that I felt like saying, well, I agree, <laughs> full stop, and, and that's enough. But, and one thing just to remember, since so many of, of us here are seekers, is to always take notes, is to always take notes. If you attend, if you're going somewhere where knowledge is being imparted and it's not worth taking notes, then go do something else. And this is one of the things you see with the scholars. Someone whose company I've been blessed to keep in the last few years, Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, who's well into his 60s. It's, not, it's notable that even now, doesn't matter who's speaking, he'll have pen and paper and he'll take notes. He won't take detailed notes and make an outline of the whole thing, but he'll have pen and paper and he'll be ready. So there's a point of benefit or a reflection that he has during the speaking of whoever is speaking, he'll jot it down. And then he'll go after and seek clarifications, even from people who are young enough to be, to be his grandchildren. And that's something one should keep in mind. So Imam Afroz made a number of excellent points, and do think deeply about them. And Imam Afroz, of, Imam Afroz, of course, is someone who embodies that concern for the brokenhearted and the needy. He, has, he, he leads a number of amazing projects locally in Australia, where he's based in Sydney, and also across the Pacific region, particularly in Fiji, where he's originally from, and a number of other countries, actively assisting those in distress, and not just sending money to those in distress, but serving and honoring those in distress. And his work is highly inspiring in that regard. He's someone who leads by example, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, and serving those in difficulty and distress, particularly around one, is not just something that is a good thing to do. It's important to remember that we have personal obligations in our deen, which are clearly defined. And we have social obligations, the furud al-kifaya. And the social or communal obligations are no less obligatory upon you than the personal obligations. But they're actually more difficult. Because if you've prayed your five prayers and you're going to sleep, and if you're Hanafi, you added the witr to it, you know you've done what is obligatory upon you in terms of prayer. If you've given your minimum zakat, You've given what was obligatory upon you of the prescribed personal obligation. But the social obligations, the furud al-kifaya, are more difficult. Why? Because they, while being incumbent upon us as a community and responsibility for them devolves to every single individual in accordance with their capacity, how much do you owe of the fard kifaya, of the communal obligation, to take care of the homeless right here in Manchester? or in, in a city nearby. It is an obligation upon you. How much is obligatory? It's not defined. How much is enough? It's not defined. And this is an opportunity for those of concern. And there's a great wisdom why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it this way. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا In order to test you, which of you is best in action. So this is both a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous responsibility and trust. But we have to remember that you know, when you're giving to, to support Muslim Hands' orphan sponsorship, or you're serving in the local community, helping the homeless, feeding the poor, spending time with the elderly, or any of the numerous ways of serving those in difficulty and distress, those brokenhearted, You are simply fulfilling 
a duty that Allah has made incumbent upon you. So be aware of that because the Prophet ﷺ made very clear that none of you believes until they wish for others of the good that they wish for themselves. None of you believes. It's a negation of the completion and perfection of your faith until you have not only the inward concern for their good, but you express that concern in sincere service to them, that you convey the good to them, not in inflating your ego by ascribing good to yourself, but rather in recognizing that this is what your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entails. Your attaining unto divine mercy is contingent upon your being a person who not only feels mercy in their heart, but who effectively expresses mercy in their life. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamhum ar-Rahman. It is only the merciful who are granted mercy by the All-Merciful. Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamkum man fil sama. It is only the merciful who are granted mercy by the most merciful, mighty and majestic. Be merciful to those on earth, and the Lord of the heavens will be merciful to you. And so your serving those who are brokenhearted and needy is an expression of your, your own need for divine mercy, your recognition that you are needy. But how do you, ex how do you express that need? How do you truly realize that need? How are you true in your claim to be in in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in your claim to consciousness of that neediness, that is your reality. It is when you express mercy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. In all ways, whether it's in your conduct, in your dealings, but also through serving those who are in greatest distress. But there's another spiritual reason why a believer who's true in seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would seek to serve those broken hearted. And that is because someone who is true in seeking Allah would themselves be broken hearted. Someone who is sincere in seeking Allah would themselves be broken hearted and they would find the right company and the right context and the right state of being with those who are themselves broken-hearted, in, whether it be spiritually or in their life circumstances. Because what, what does it mean to be broken-hearted? You can be broken-hearted because of the difficulties of life, the struggles, whether they're the economic struggles, whether they're political struggles, whether they're struggles of health or wealth or emotional struggles. So many people lead lives of quiet desperation and are broken hearted. Whether it is being broken hearted because of broken relations or failures or loss. But all of these distresses are simply one of the doors of broken heartedness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the doors of being patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, of being outwardly broken out of the rigors of life, recognizing the majesty of Allah thereby and being patient before the blows of fate. But there's also the brokenheartedness of the one who recognizes the tremendous gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. And Imam Afroz touched upon this. Right? That the brokenheartedness of the one who recognizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings and is overwhelmed and is overwhelmed, is just absolutely humbled, and they crumble out of a sense of absolute rejoicing, an absolute sense that I do not deserve this, O oh Allah, I am totally indebted to you, and they crumble before the beauty of their beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's also the brokenheartedness of lovers in the intensity of yearning for their beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every believer if their faith were true, would be broken-hearted. Whether it's broken-hearted before the blows of fate, but that broken-heartedness is sweet. Why? 
Because the, the one who recognizes that their distress and their difficulty is being sent from the one they love, every slap from the beloved is so sweet. As one of the great scholars of the 20th century, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Shahuri said, Kufufu al-Habibi ma ahlaha. The slaps of the beloved, how sweet they are. Because as Ibn Ata'illah said, ليخفف عنك ألم البلاء علمك بأنه هو مبليك Let it diminish the pain of your calamity or your distress to know that it is he who is trying you. And are you used to anything from him except what is good for you? So, in that brokenheartedness, in, a, in something that apparently would be difficult, the believer finds sweetness. Because when you break that hard rock of your heart into little bits and you crumble before the majesty of the divine, that is an act of coming to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that state of contented patience, in the rigors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends you. But the same is true when blessings come to you. If blessings, when they manifest, do not break your heart, your heart is in need of breaking. Because when a blessing comes to you, do you lose yourself in the blessing? Or do you recognize it for what it is? It too is something that is coming to you from Allah. Far more tremendous than anything that you deserve. Anything that you can give the full due for. Those blessings are trusts from Allah. And you should be humble and crumble in your absolute sense of gratitude before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, when we claim love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love should, should break one. One of the great poets of Islam, Ibn al-Farid, he imagined someone coming to him and saying that I want to be, I want to tread the path of love. And he says to this person that what I, that considering your state, what I see is that you should leave me, should leave this way. But if you wish, choose whatever seems pleasing to you. Because what is the way of love? He says, Rahatuhu ana. It's even being in at rest as a lover is, is toil and turmoil. And the beginning of love is feeling completely you know, thirsty, right? is feeling completely bereft of anything. And its end is death. And the end of love is death. Love is painful. Right? And the scholars came up with all kinds of definitions of love. But love breaks the lover. Right? Love breaks and crumbles the lover. Because the lover cannot bear to be even a moment away, away from their beloved. But every step you take towards the beloved, you still feel your distance from the beloved. Everything you do for the beloved, you recognize that the beloved deserves more. And the lover is confused and overwhelmed. And love is not easy. And we'll quote some, some lines of poetry about the brokenheartedness of the lover. And those of you know who, who know Arabic, this is not a translation. It's a creative approximation to the, the, to the poem of Abu Madian, because it is very eloquent. And passion is difficult to convey. And I consulted Sheikh Idris on one section of it, and neither of us came to a satisfactory conclusion. So, Madaya Uraib al Hayi, Aini Tarakumu, Wa Asma Uni Tilka Diyari Nidakumu. This is Abu Madian, this great saint of, of the Western lands of Islam, whose students amazed Ibn Arabi. He says, when, O oh dear one of the neighborhood, will my eyes come to see you? And I hear 
from those houses your call. وَيَجْمَعُنَا الدَّهْرُ الَّذِي حَالَ بَيْنَنَا وَتَحْضَى بِكُمْ قَلْبِي وَعَيْنِي تَرَاكُمُ And when will time gather us together after separating us and my heart find you and my eyes behold you? Of course, if we take a pause here, love was difficult for the Arabs. The Arabs were a desert people. And they had complicated love situations, CLS, because the kids would often take care of their sheep, the boys and the girls. But then when the age came, when they're going to get closer to maturity, they'll be separated. So many people would fall in love at that age. But then if your tribe was at an oasis, everyone had to go and get water from the oasis. And you might notice someone and see how beautiful she is or notice how handsome he is. But then your tribe goes one way and her tribe goes another. And when will you see the one you loved again? Okay. So the lover would sometimes come back to that encampment or that oasis. But nothing remains except some imagined traces of the beloved. Or even if you're in a small village or a town, after maturity, the girls would no longer come out. But you're in love, so what can you do? And of course, this is a metaphor for a higher love. She says, Amurru al abwadi min ghayri hajatin, la'alli arakum, aw ara man yarakumu. I passed by the doors without any need. So that I may just see you or see someone who has seen you. Right? And of course, don't do this, guys. <laughs> right? Like, especially don't stare into people's windows. Someone actually asked me, I quoted this line. So I said, Does it mean I can look into people's houses? Let's talk about doors, number one. Secondly, it's a metaphor. Number three, it's not literal. Right? It's not literal. And he's not telling you the fiqh of courtship. So, you know, that's not what it's about. Context, please. I pass by the doors without need. So that it may be that I see you. And if I don't see you, then I see someone who's seen you. Right? Lovers are crazy. That's why the great lover in the Islamic tradition, Majnoon, was called the mad one. Right? I was called the mad one from the pain of my passion. Saqani al-hawa ka'san min al-hubbi safiyan. Passion poured for me a cup of pure love. And I wish when he gave me that cup, he gave you one too. Because the lover always fears that I love the beloved. But does the beloved love me? Because as one of the poets put it, Junintu bilayla wa junnat bilaylina. Right, one of the poets said, I went mad in love of Layla, and she went mad in love of other than us. And the most difficult of madness is her madness. So the lover is always concerned that does the, does the beloved love me? Right? Do they feel the love that I feel for them? So he's worried, right? this lover is worried that does the beloved love me? And does the beloved accept my claim of love? So he says. And the poets, of course, come up with the most beautiful of metaphors. He says, He says, So I wish that the judge of love would judge between us. And the claimant of passion, when they call me, call you as well. So to settle the matter, to establish that I do love you, so love me too. أنا عبدكم بل عبد عبد لعبدكم ومملوككم من بيعكم وشراكم I am your servant, but rather I'm the servant of your servants, and I'm owned. I'm your possession in your buying and your selling. That's the lover. The lover is at the service of, at the behest of the, of the beloved, and not just at the behest of the beloved, 
but at the behest of those beloved to the beloved. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm your possession. You can buy me, you can sell me, you can do whatever you want with me. Because the lover has no objection before the beloved. كَتَبْتُ لَكُمْ نَفْسِي وَمَا مَلَكَتْ يَدِي وَإِنْ قَلَّتِ الْأَمْوَالُ رُوحِ فِدَاكُمُ I have written for you myself and all that I possess. And if my, if my wealth is insufficient, then my very soul is ransomed to you. لِسَانِ بِمَجْدِكُمْ وَقَلْبِ بِحُبِّكُمْ وَمَا نَظَرَتْ عَيْنِي مَلِيحًا سِوَاكُمُ My tongue is ever magnifying you. And my heart is ever in love with you. And my eyes never saw anyone seemingly besides you. Right? Right? There's only one that is beautiful to the beloved. And I was once walking in Damascus with Imam Zayd, and he asked the wackiest questions. And most of the time, none of us knew the answer. Right? He asked strange things like, what is the Arab of Zaydun Karimin? Right? It should be Zaydun Karimun. But Zaydun Karimin. It was a trick question, right? Because the cat is of Tashbih. And he asked strange questions. You, so I just smile and like, wonder why is he testing me? But, you, you know, but the walks would be interesting. So one day he asked, have you heard the story of the man who was madly in love with this really beautiful woman in the old city here in Damascus? And he'd follow her wherever he, she went? I was kind of embarrassed because we were actually walking through the old city. And that wouldn't happen. Right? But most of love is imagined, right? So yeah, there was this young man who was madly in love with this woman. And whenever she came out from the house, he'd be talking about how beautiful she is and how, how much he loves her and how he's lost in her love and how there's no one in this world like her. And of course, she never gave him any attention. And that's the pain of love. There's no pain more poignant than unrequited love. But then one day she turned around and she asked, am I really that beautiful? She says, yes, you are. She says, do you really love me that much? She says, yes, I do. She says, do you really see no one else in this world but me? She said, yes. She says, my sister's across the street. She's even more beautiful. And he looked for a moment and she gave him a big slap. And she said, the lover never turns away. She says, and my eyes not, never saw anyone seemingly but you. And nothing has honored these worlds but your beauty. And those in love direct themselves to nothing but your radiance. And of course, you can start wondering now, who is this beloved? Isn't interesting. He says, And if it's said to me, Who, after Allah, are you desirous of? Who, by Allah, are you desirous of? If it is said to me, Who, by Allah, are you desirous of? I would say, the good pleasure of the All-Merciful, and then your good pleasure. So who is he talking about? Think about it. And the scholars actually differ. Right? Because one of the, the tricks, because the, the lover would be jealous about his love. Right? Because imagine, Zubair is a desert Arab, and he was at some oasis. And he ran into this lady. Later he found out her name is Zubayda. And she was so beautiful. He's hoping that she might love him too. Maybe there would be some way her family would agree to marry. Though they're from the wrong tribes and so on. So the lover naturally tries to conceal his love. Right? Because if Bilal finds out that Zubayda is so beautiful, then maybe Bilal will marry her. And that's, you know. And the lover wants to hide their beloved. But one of the problems with love is you can't hide love. Right? You can tell a lover from a distance. Mulana Rumi was asked, what color was the skin of the dog of the people of the cave? And he immediately responded, pale. And he said, how do you know? 
Because there's nothing in the Quran that explicitly affirms his being pale. And he said, because he was a lover, and lovers are pale. He was a lover, and lovers are pale. So he says, and if it's asked of me, by Allah, who, do, who are you desirous of? I would say, the good pleasure of Allah, and then your good pleasure. So is, is he talking about Allah himself, and trying to hide his love? Some have interpreted it that way. Others say, no, he's talking about the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, وَلِي مُقْلَةٌ بِالدَّمْعِ تَجْرِي صَبِيبَةً حَرَامٌ عَلَيْهَا النَّوْمُ حَتَّى تَرَاكُمُ He said, and I have eyes that constantly flow with tears. Sleep is prohibited for them until, I until they behold you. Now, separation is a reality for, for the lover. Right? You fall in love and God knows where the beloved is going. He says, خُذُونِ عِظَامًا مُحْمَلًا أَيْنَ سِرْتُمُ وَحَيْثُ حَلَلْتُمْ فَادْفِنُونِ حِذَاكُمُ Take me as bones in your baggage. مُحْمَلًا I don't expect to ride in your caravan, but just put me as bones in your, you know, in your luggage. Because a lover loses everything, even you know, their own skin and bones wither away. So take me as just mere bones in your luggage. I don't expect to be in your caravan itself, riding with you. Take me as bones and carry it wherever you go and wherever you stop, then bury me by your side. Because that's the end of the lover. The lover is completely broken. The lover is completely broken. So take me as bones, carry wherever you go, and wherever you come to rest, then bury me by your side. وَدُورُوا عَلَىٰ قَبْرِي بِطَرْفِ نِعَالِكُمْ فَتَحْيَ عِظَامِي حَيْثُ أَصْغَى نِذَاكُمُ And walk around my grave with the sides of your sandal, so that my bones come to life when they hear your call. What is your call? The footsteps of your sandals. So if I can't be with you in this life, at least maybe if you bury me by your side, you'll pass by my grave. And just hearing your footsteps will bring my bones back to life. And say, May Allah protect you, O you who died in yearning. And may He grant you Firdaus, may he grant you the highest of paradise, close to your sanctuary, close to your sanctuary. And this is being broken hearted, right? Is to give yourself completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's love. And that is love. Right? Because what is love? They say, Al Mahabbatu and Tahaba kullaka liman ahbab hatta la yaqa laka minka shaykh. Love is that you give yourself completely to, to the one you love until nothing remains of yourself for yourself. Right? But that is when you are granted true life. Right? That is when you're granted true life. So what do you do with that life if you seek to live in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Live it in, in those ways of the most beloved. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right? and the most beloved of Allah's creation, our beloved messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who did he spend his time with? He spent his time with the poor. He chose a life of poverty, though he could have the greatest of wealth. Why? Because he would give all that he had, because that is what love entails. It, Abdullah ibn Rawaha said, لَهُ رَاحَةٌ لَوْ أَنَّ مِقْدَى لَوْ أَنَّ مِعْشَارَ جُونِهَا عَلَى الْبَرِّ the Prophet ﷺ was a giver. Why? Because nothing remained of his self. He had broken himself completely. Any sense of self was gone. He was Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. He was completely for Allah, the Lord of the world. And that is true life. And that's why he was a giver. He would give of his wealth. He didn't keep any money. 
the Abdullah bin Raha said he has a hand so generous that if even a portion of its generosity fell upon dry land, the land would be wetter than the oceans. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gave of his attention. He gave of his concern. He gave of his time. He gave of all that he had. Why? Because that is mercy. Right? What is the characteristic of a lover? A lover is seeking their beloved. Right? And how do you attain that? By being an embodiment of mercy. Right? Being an embodiment of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Not just out of a sense of awe of the divine, but also out of a sense of thankfulness to the divine. Out of a sense of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who experience being absolutely broken hearted. Not just in distress, but in ease. By beholding everything that one has as being from Allah. And seeking with everything that one has the one beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes true believers, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And those who believe are more intense in their love of Allah. But then one has to see, how, how are you living your life? Live a life of intensity of love. Don't make mediocre choices. You, you're taking a career path. Don't just walk on a safe, trodden path. Look at where you can direct yourself in life that will be beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pursue that path in seeking the love of Allah. Look at your time and how you spend it. Don't waste it on foolishness. It won't really matter who won the Premier League on the Day of Judgment. What did you do with your time? I spent it in love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it would be a hard argument to make that watching a Manchester City game would be beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Spend your time as a lover. Spend your concern as a lover. Right, watching those little silly YouTube videos of people you know, walking across the street and they fell into a ditch and another person fell and one fell on the other and the second guy didn't fit in. I say, isn't that funny? And look, 50 million people saw it and you come back two months later, 150 million people saw it and you're like, you share it with some friends and you add to the hit list of folly. So what? Spend your time as a lover would. Strive to spend every moment in seeking your beloved and know where to find your beloved. And one of the ways is to be active in serving those who are broken hearted. And the broken hearted are not just the economically broken hearted. There are countless people who are leading lives of desperation. They're disconnected from family. They may have had disputes with family and they're disconnected. And they're in social desperation. People who disconnect from friends. People who are struggling with sins and therefore they've stepped away from their old circles of friends. And they're in states of broken heartedness and desperation. But no one is reaching out to them with a helping hand. There's people who are in all kinds of desperation. Look where Allah has placed you and how you can be someone who can find Allah by serving those who are broken hearted for His sake. And also of course, from the, from the sense of being with the broken hearted, is to spend time with those who have broken their hearts, and who have broken their selves, in, have, by having come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who realize the realities of thankfulness, of majesty, of love, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? those who will teach you how to crumble your heart before the glory and majesty and beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of such people. But then direct yourself to those actions of those who love. I heard something truly inspiring from Shaykh Afifuddin al Jailani. And many of you probably know it, but you know the tradition of the Langar Sharif, that you know, people give food. Shaykh Afifuddin al Jailani, his family are, are direct descendants of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jailani, and they're, they're, his family are the custodians of the maqam of Sidi Abdul Qadir Qaddasallahu Sirrahu in Baghdad and he mentioned that Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jailani himself established an endowment to feed the poor with his own money and he encouraged others to give and they've been feeding poor people irrespective of who they are without fail and without missing a single day
from the time of Sayyidina Abdul Qadir Jailani to this day, even through the invasions of Iraq and the Gulf War and the US invasion and, and all kinds of crises, and even in exile, Sheikh Abif al-Din al-Jailani is in Malaysia. It, his life is under threat if he goes to Iraq, but they've continued to feed the poor. Right? That is an expression of intensity of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us as individuals and organizations to be of those who express our concern for Allah by having true concern for His creation. Wa sallallahu ala nabina wa habibina Muhammad, Imam Ahlul Huda wa ashabihi wa man bihi tada wa sallim tasliman kathira wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.